mm -hmm. and then they would bring in other lectures as a result of my appearing. But I, I, as I say, my friends tell me, they say, John, you paid your debt. Uh, there's no reason that you can't make the, shouldn't make the best living you can. But I say it's just where I feel about it, and I'm not going to abuse that. What do you say to the people who, as they're sitting right now watching you here on Midday, think of you as the enemy of the people, as the man who betrayed the president? That, well, and, and it, respond sure, to you in that I'm, way. I'm sure that there are people who feel that way. The snitch, uh, the, 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 we learn from the time we're in kindergarten. Not to tell tales. You don't, you're not a tattletale. That's a bad thing. But yet there's a, there's a strange uh, situation in our society because people one, want people to tell the truth. Mm. But yet when someone does, he's likely to become a pariah for having done it. And maybe the perjurer becomes more respected, or the stonewaller becomes more respected than the man who tells the truth. What about your but, own uh, self-image with regard to that? You, you write in the book about thinking of yourself as a, a stoolie. I don't think that's the word you I use. I, I call myself, uh, as, as we were called in prison, a, a rat when you are cooperating with the government. Uh, a snitch, uh, Let, all those uh, things. Take us back. To, I remember so well. I mean, it is like you have this movie projector in your head. I have a similar thing. I can see John Dean under oath, and I can see the headlines accusing the president. Take us back in your head to that day and your own self-image. Were you feeling like a stool pigeon, or were you feeling like a guy who was just safe covering his own tracks? I was, I was very much wrestling at that time with this whistleblower problem. Uh, but what I really came down to is I had two options. One was to lie, the other was to tell the truth. That was no option for me. So it, when I, when I, by the time I got there, uh, as I say, while I was wrestling with it, uh, uh, I'd resolved in my own uh, mind and, 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 and heart what I felt was right to do. Now, in those days, of course, when I was, the, the, the emotion I had walking in there at the time and testifying, was that uh, uh, I was well aware of the enormity of what was going to happen, and it was very frightening. It was also very lonely, because there was only my lawyer and my wife who believed me. And uh, after I testified, uh, there were a number of people who did believe me, but not until the tapes came out were people sure that uh, the fact that I'd testified contrary to the president, to Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Mitchell. Yeah. The, tapes, like. the tapes, tapes, I think, really astounded people that your memory had been as astute and as accurate as it had been. We'll take a break. When we come back, I want to ask you some of your feelings about Richard Nixon, and we'll continue with John Dean after this. John Dean is with us, and in your book, John, you write about your behavior in the presence of President Nixon. You, you were described it at one point as guppy-like and naive at one point. Did, what was your personal feeling about Richard Nixon? Did you like him? Did you enjoy him as, a, as an individual, as, as, a, as a fellow human being, or could you never get beyond the facade of president? Well, it, it, uh, I had different relations with him at different stages. When I first met him, for example, in my earlier dealings with him, it was much like uh, uh, we were on camera. Uh, that it was a very formal setting. There's that story I tell about the time the, the long-haired college kids came in, and I later asked why the president had me in at this meeting, where we're staging a meeting to be talking about the budget, something I'd never talked to the president about in my life. And then he said a few words to the students who'd come in, and then said, well, a young person like John here has as a voice in this administration, and, uh, and then had me say a few words, but I left that meeting very confused about why I'd been there. Later talking to Hallam, and I said, Bob, why was I in that meeting? And he said, John, you were in there because the president thinks you look hippie. Thinks it you, John Dean? Now, I <laughs> asked you folks, does this man look hippie to you? That's an interesting insight into the president. Uh, but as I say, that was a very stage-type meeting, and, yeah. and most of my early meetings with him were that way. It really wasn't until uh, I had uh, sort of handled that cover-up all those days, and, and uh, we'd had the common bond of, of, a, of a very serious problem that Nixon sort of broke down and, and uh, uh, became much easier to talk with, much less uh, formal. You became very close with him as time well, in, passed. In, in the rapport, yes, and, and uh, uh, you know, he was very open in his conversations with me and, and, uh, and the like. So. The, the Nixon I saw was, was a very complex man. What about the, the Nixon who saw the John Dean blow the whistle? 
What, if, what are your private thoughts about what he must have been thinking about you? Have you had any communication from him? No, I haven't. The only clue I've even had is a rather interesting clue that uh, while talking to the House Impeachment Committee staff, they told me of a fascinating tape. It's a tape of Nixon listening to other tapes. And <laughs> in, walks, in walks Ron Ziegler as he's listening to these tapes of conversations with me. And he says to Ziegler, he says, you know, Dean tried to warn me. He's the only expletive deleted around here that, uh, uh, that tried to warn me. Now, I don't know if that's his feeling today, and I don't know if that feeling lasted, because I'm sure he thought uh, uh, that stonewalling was the appropriate course. Mm -hmm. I want to read a quote from the book. That This is a quote where you're describing yourself in, in relation to the men, Haldeman and Ehrlichman, who were around you. Deep down, I was meek. Deep down, deep down I was a meek, favor currying staff man, not hard-boiled enough to play the game Ehrlichman and, and Mitchell play. Now, I wonder if, if in writing that, you're not kind of asking for some sympathy in a backhanded way because you were, in fact, hard-boiled enough to stand up and testify against these men, which seemed to me to take a lot of guts. So on one level, you're saying you didn't have the hard crust to do it the way they did it, but look what you did anyway. What's you're, the nature of that statement? The, uh, the time you're talking about is a different phase of the book than when I'm later testifying. I, I found that I, I uh, had more guts than I thought I did uh, later in, in being able to stand up and, and say what I thought uh, uh, was right and what should be done. And so uh, you say you found that. How did you find it? The hard way. <laughs> well, it's obvious that it was all learned the hard way. The hard but I mean, way. Was it, uh, was it out of a survival mechanism, mostly, that you saw what was <clears throat> going to happen to you and then you there, saw the truth? There is no doubt that... Uh, at uh, one stage, I realized that the best course for me to protect myself was to tell the truth. And there was a saving of my neck uh, element in it. There was also the fact, though, that by that time, I had become so exasperated with the cover-up and the life that it was uh, forcing on me. And I had failed internally trying to stop the cover-up from continuing and trying to, to tell everybody, we've got to step forward and let the president carve this away. Because I, for a long time, thought Nixon could save himself. Even as late as my testimony before the Irvin Committee, I thought if he came forward, people would say, well, he's an SOB, but we don't want to go through the trauma of impeachment and all that. And if he would have said what he had done, honestly, openly... Yeah, uh, I, many Americans, I think, felt I, that. I think he could have saved himself still, but uh, he was not capable of that. John, Maureen, your wife, was on the show, I don't know, about a year or so ago. It seems as if she was, she was a pivotal person in your life at one time when we know that Richard Nixon and, and the associates wanted you to write the infamous Dean report that would right. allegedly say that there were no cover-ups and so forth. And they were pressuring you to do this. You went to Camp David. Maureen got you in a different frame of thinking. What did she do? Well, I, as you know, from I, I relate some of the conversations where I had been resisting this with the president. Yeah, you didn't want to write it. You knew that. I didn't that want to write it. I knew what it was. was, but, was it would have been some, fiction. But somehow, I, you know, I'd gone off to Camp David. I'd had the assignment to do it, and it was in just a, a Mo was not aware of all the facts. But I told her, you know, roughly what I was going to do, and I was going to I was being asked to write this report that would make everything uh, a whitewash, and Mo just with a with that beautiful intuitive uh, nature she has said john she said that's stupid that's that's wrong you shouldn't do that and i thought my god she's really right you know and and uh, it just it hit the bell at the right moment and uh, that's that happened many times uh, between us and one of the interesting things about watergate is it certainly opened up my communication channels with my wife and i think made for a far different and better marriage than i could have ever but hoped but it is have. hard to conceive of having a marriage growing with, with one of the, the participants <coughs> being under the kind of pressure that you were under. But strangely, it did, because we talked about it, and we were open about it. And today, while that pressure isn't there, those channels are still open, and uh, uh, she's not only my wife, my lover, she's also my best friend. That's a good combination. It is. What, into something that may, may be a hidden, not a hidden, but maybe one of the major forces on Election Day, less than two weeks away, the pardon, the Ford pardon of Nixon. I don't want to put you in a speculative motif, because you have always been John Dean, the man with the memory and the facts. What do you know about the mechanism that produced the Ford pardon of Nixon? I know no more than I've read in the newspaper. I know of no deal. I do know of friends who were still in the, in the Nixon White House at that time as he was leaving. 
and and they told me that uh, then President Nixon was very concerned about going to jail. He was worried. Uh, if there was a nod of the head, but no deal, it wouldn't surprise me. But I don't know of it, so I I have no facts in, any more than anyone else. All right, let's let's turn back to some of the newsmaking uh, aspects of your book. The fact that you bring up points about. Nixon saying, we've got to get to Jerry Ford on this, and we have to get this investigation, you know, the whitewash, the committee even being formed. You have not, you've been, you have not been acknowledged by President Ford as being accurate, and Cook, the other participant, says that you're not accurate. What's the case? Is it another case of John uh, Dean being the only one with I'm the truth? I'm afraid it's, uh, I know exactly where, what happened, and, and I've recounted it in the book. R related uh, to us now. Well, it, it has to do with the Patman Committee hearings that uh, I had told the president, President Nixon, that uh, Ford wasn't doing his part. I'd learned that from Cook. We his part was supposed to be what? To help the Republicans get together to block subpoenas from being issued by the Patman Committee, which could start an investigation that could have opened up. It could have been the Urban Committee hearings that mm -hmm. early. Uh, I told that to the president. The president gave very explicit orders to Haldeman uh, and myself that uh, uh, Ford was to be brought into it. Why Ford? Just because, because he was minority because leader? He was or minority leader. Was there a special thing about his loyalty that, that well, Nixon had, sensed? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what Nixon sensed. I can't put yeah. my, myself in, in his head. I know that Ford was frequently asked to do things for the, the Nixon White House as minority leader. But anyway, I later learned that indeed uh, I assumed that the orders had been passed because Timmons and Cook were relating back to me that Ford was uh, sending a letter to the minority members, the Republican members, calling a meeting in Les Aaron's office of, of them to get them together so they would all march to the same drum and go in there and block the hearings. Uh, now, the, some deny that today, that uh, this, this has happened. I noticed in last night's uh, uh, paper that Dick Cook, who had once so flat out denied it, has now certainly slipped off his flat denial and say, I can't really categorically say that I didn't tell Dean that. Uh, I don't recall for sure, so we're, it, it's the flat denial. But, but Ford gone. says categorically that he did not speak with someone from the White House about this. As, as I recall, he says uh, that he doesn't uh, have a clear recollection no, of no, it. No recollection, and he stick, is sticking by that testimony, by testimony. rather than readdressing himself to the specific points that you've raised, which right. I think has raised a big question mark in a lot of people's minds. And also, it may have raised the point, what is John Dean doing? Is he trying to topple President Ford? Was he the one that, why did he blow the whistle in a way on well, butts for Rolling Stone. The, what? Let, let me explain that. For example, on, on the current dispute between myself and the president, uh, I thought this book was coming out in 77. That's when it's... After the election. After the election. Uh, what happened, the reason it's out today is book of the month selected it for their November selection. No I, political uh, considerations beyond selling the books. Well, I don't think that even entered their mind uh, at the time that uh, Book of the Month selected it, because their shipments would come out after, a lot of them after the election. Well, that's the book publishing business, yeah, not the so business So I, I, I had no idea. The other thing is, I've already testified about this before the Senate Watergate Committee. I was told by somebody in Washington that they believe that the reason Ford was asked these questions during his confirmation hearing was because of my Senate testimony. No one has ever asked me before about it. I've mentioned it in talking to students who've raised it. There have been newspaper people in the audience. I've said the same thing then. It's certainly passed over their heads uh, at that time. So mm -hmm. it's very surprising that these things come up now as, 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 and that I can't accept the charge that I'm doing this to sell books. I'm just telling a story that uh, that happened to be part of the story. And there's a certain coincidence factor involved with when the book came That's out. Right. We'll take a break and continue with John Dean after this. <laughs> 